Welcome to section 2, question 4 of the 2010 Mathematical Methods Exam 2. In this video we will be looking at the solutions and examination advice for this question. A reminder that this video is in no way endorsed by VCAR. And finally, as we progress through this question you will notice that there are colour coded boxes to indicate how likely the CAS calculator is to be used in efficiently answering the question. So question 4 starts off by asking us to consider the function f with a domain of all real numbers with a rule of 1 on 27 times 2x subtract 1 cubed times 6 minus 3x and then plus 1 at the end. And part a asks us to find the x coordinate of each of the stationary points of f and to state the nature of each of these stationary points. So there's a little bit involved here and it is worth 4 marks. So the first thing that we'll need to do is we'll need to find the derivative f dashed of x. We're going to need to solve that equal to zero. And we do that to find the stationary points of the graph. So we know when the derivative is equal to zero, that's when a graph or a function will have stationary points. On the CAS calculator, go into the main menu. Next, we want to type the rule in for f. So bringing up the keyboard, we can type in the fraction 1 on 27. And then in brackets, we have 2x subtract 1, and that's raised to the power of 3, multiplied by 6 subtract 3x, and that's just raised to the power of 1, and then we have plus 1 at the end. So what we want to do is we want to highlight that and calculate the derivative, so we can go interactive calculation diff to do that, and hit OK. And then we want to solve this derivative equal to 0. And we want to solve that for x. So interactive equation and quality solve for x. So from the calculator, we found that the x coordinates, so just the x values of the stationary points, occurred when x is equal to 1 half, as well as when x is equal to 13 over 8. So they're the two values of x where there's a stationary point on this graph. Now a quick way to work out what the nature of those two stationary points are using a calculator is just to graph it. So if I click on the graph icon, and then I just want to work out the original function, not the derivative. So that's the original graph f. I drag that down and it gives us this graph. And pressing the plus button on the hard keypad, I can just zoom in. And we can see that it appears as if there's a stationary point of inflection here. And that looks like it's when x is a half and a local maximum at what must be the 13 on 8 value. So we could sketch that graph and argue by a graph what those two stationary points are. Or we could use a sign diagram, which is the second method that I'll demonstrate. So that's where we set up x values that relate to these stationary points, as well as x values before and after them. So an x value before the first stationary point could be 0. So we could consider the x value of 0. Then we can consider the x value of 1 half, which is the first stationary point. And then we need a value between 1 half and 13 on 8. So a half is 0.5 and 13 on 8 is going to be a little bit bigger than 1 but less than 2. So we can go 1 as a value in between. And then of course we do 13 on 8. And then we need a value that's bigger than 13 on 8. So we could select a nice easy value of 2 there. So then we'll need to calculate the derivatives value for each of these values. And then finally we'll need to think about what the slope means given the derivatives value. So we're going to complete a table here to do that. So before we actually get to calculating any of those derivative values, we know that f dashed of x equaled 0 when x equaled 1 half and when x equaled 13 on 8. So that means the f dashed of x value when x is a half is 0 when x is 13 on 8, it's also 0. And now we can use a CAS calculator to find the derivative when x is 0, 1, and 2. So we now need to calculate the derivative values at each of those x values that we've just identified. So the first thing I'm going to do on the calculator is I'm going to drag down an expression for the derivative, which is this line here. And then I'm going to go keyboard and then math 3. And we're going to do given that x equals 0 first. And then hitting execute will give us the derivative value when x is 0. And then I can copy that line down and replace the 0. And I could put a half in, but I know 0 is just going to come out. So the next one I'm going to calculate is 1. And that gives the derivative's value is 5 on 9. And then dragging that same line down and replacing x equals 1 with x equals 2. We find the derivative when x equals 2 is negative 3. 
So they are three of the values we need to quote in that table. So from the CAS calculator, we found that the derivatives value when x was zero was 13 on nine. When x was one, it was five on nine. And when x was two, it was negative three. So interpreting that, this is a positive slope, and then it's zero, and then it's positive on the other side of that stationary point. So that's an inflection point. And then we get another slope of zero, and then we get a negative slope down here. So that second stationary point is actually a local maximum. So we just need to summarize that for our final answer. So we've now fully answered the question by finding the x values of the stationary points of f, and we've now stated that there's a stationary point of inflection when x equals 1 half, and a local maximum at x equals 13 on 8. Or, as I said earlier, we could have also argued that x was a stationary point of inflection using a graph, and similarly that x equals 13 on 8 gave a local maximum from the graph that's shown on the calculator. So that would have been a different method you could have used instead of that sign diagram that I showed. So from the examiner's report, we can see that 54% of students got that question correct, and that the examiner goes on to say that that question was done quite well with more than half of the cohort being awarded full marks. The examiner also goes on to say that students should be familiar with the terminology point of inflection. So that's pointing out that a number of students in this exam didn't know how to categorize the stationary point at x equals a half. So it was a stationary point of inflection. Next, the question introduces another function, still f, but it now has parameters a and b in it that are real constants. So we can see that this function f has a domain of all real numbers and a rule that's very similar to the previous one that we had, but now it's one on 27 times ax minus one cubed times b minus three x with a plus one still at the end. And for part b, it asks us to write down in terms of a and b, so that means a and b will appear in our answer, the possible values of x for which the coordinate x comma f of x is a stationary point of f. So essentially it's a similar question to what we did just before. We want to find the values of x where there's stationary points on the graph, but now our answers will be in terms of a and b. So once again, we're calculating the derivative f dash of x and we're going to let it equal zero. And this is now an equation we can solve using a CAS calculator. So next on the calculator, we wanna go back up to the main screen and bring up the keyboard so that we can enter in our next function, which is also f. And you can see that we're going to use that a few times. So in that reading time in the exam, hopefully you saw that you're gonna use this new function f a few times. So it's gonna be worth defining it. So I'm going to go and type in one on 27 and then in brackets, this time instead of two x minus one, we've generalized it to ax subtract one, and then that's cubed. And then instead of the six minus three x, we've now got b minus three x, and then we've still got the plus one at the end. So this is just a generalized version of the first function that we looked at. So we're going to just check that we've put that in correctly, which it appears that I have, and now I'm gonna define it. So interactive define as f of x, and we can hit okay. The next thing we want to do is we want to calculate the derivative and then set that equal to zero. So we can go interactive calculation diff and hit OK. And then I can actually just put the equal zero on this line here that I've just highlighted and go interactive equation equality solve for X. And that will solve the derivative of F equal to zero. And that gives us these two solutions. So from the calculator, we found that X is equal to and it's going to be one on A, and the second value is going to be equal to B on four plus one on four A. So they are our values of X in terms of A and B, where stationary points can occur on the graph of F. For part C, it asks, for what value of A does F have no stationary points? So in other words, there'll be no solutions to F dashed of X equaling zero. So if we do look at part B, we can see that x equals one on A and x equals B divided by four plus one over four A. They are the two possible values of x where a stationary point can occur on F. And now we're considering for what value of A will these solutions not exist in other words. So if A equals zero, 
we'd get no stationary points because you'd be trying to divide by zero. So just to summarize our thinking, we actually want the denominator equal zero, and that will give us no solutions to the equation above, which means there'll be no stationary points on the graph. So that's what I've just written there. To have no stationary points, we actually want the denominator to equal zero. So therefore, we will have no stationary points if a is equal to zero. So a equals zero is the answer to part C of this question. From the examiner's report, we can see that only 38% of students got 4B correct, which is defined in A and B, the values of X, where there was a stationary point on the graph. And you could see from the previous slide that that was actually quite an easy problem to do using the calculator. So for 4C, we can see that 47% of students got that question correct and that the examiner goes on to say that the denominator cannot equal zero was a key fact in answering that problem. And that's because if a equals zero, f actually is a linear function. So if we unpack that idea a little bit more, if a equals zero, the function f of x would actually have become one on 27, bracket zero x minus one cubed, times b subtract three x, plus one, and simplifying that, we'd actually just get one on 27 times negative one cubed, which is negative one on 27. And then that would be multiplied by b subtract three x plus one. And that's a linear rule as the examiner pointed out. And the examiner goes on to say that some students incorrectly wrote that a does not equal zero rather than identifying the value of a for which f has no stationary points. So when A does not equal zero, that's actually when you'll get one or more stationary points. And it's when A equals zero that you get a linear graph and therefore there's no stationary points. Part D of this question asks us to find A in terms of B if F has one stationary point. So to tackle this question, if we want one stationary point, then the two X values where there could be stationary points need to be equal. So from what we found previously, we will want one divided by a to equal b divided by four plus one on four a. And this is now an equation that the calculator can solve quite quickly for us. So going back to our calculator, we just want to solve this equal to the second x value where there's a stationary point, because if these two things are equal, like we just discussed, there'll only be one stationary point. And the question asks to find A in terms of B. So that means we want to solve this for A. So we go interactive equation of quality solve. But instead of solving for X, we want to go to variables and select A. And this gives us A in terms of B. And that is that A is equal to three on B. So therefore, from the calculator, we found A in terms of B was A equals three divided by B. So that is the answer to part D of this question. For part E, it asks, what is the maximum number of stationary points that F can have? So I actually start off by just stating the answer. And the answer is that F can have a maximum possible number of stationary points of two. So that's the answer we'd need to give for part E. Now I just wanna explain how we reach that conclusion. So the maximum number of stationary points that F can have they will occur at the x values of one on a, and the second one would have been at x equals b on four plus one on four a. So they're the two possible solutions to the derivative being equal to zero. So the maximum number of stationary points we can have is two. We just count those up, one and two. And to have two stationary points, we'd also require those two do not equal each other. So we'd have one on A is not equal to B on four plus one on four A. So we don't need to write down that green bit. That's just an explanation for how we know that there's two stationary points. The only thing we would have needed to answer in that question or write down is two. That is the maximum number of stationary points that F can have. And from the examiner's report, we can see that only 14% of students got four D correct with over 80% of students getting zero marks for that question. So that question just relied on you solving the two stationary point X values being equal to each other and then using the calculator to find that. For 4E, we can see students were a little bit more successful on that. 
with 37% of students identifying that the maximum number of stationary points of F was two. And the examiner goes on to say that it was pleasing to see a number of students answer this question correctly, even though they had not attempted the previous parts. So it's important in exams to look for questions where you can re-enter the problem and get some more marks, even if you weren't able to do some of the previous parts. And the other comment here was that some students wrote three as their answer as F was a quartic polynomial function. So if you had have had a more generic quartic polynomial function, it would be true that you can have up to three stationary points on that graph. But the way that F was presented in this question, there was a maximum of two stationary points for that problem. So for part F, we're still considering the same function F, which we've considered from part B onwards. And it goes on to say that we assume that there's a stationary point at 1, 1, and another stationary point at P, P, where P does not equal 1. And we want to find that value of P. So from previous parts of this question, we knew that stationary points occurred at the x values of 1 on A and the other x value was B on 4 plus 1 on 4A. So they're the two x values where stationary points occur. So if we know one of the stationary points is at 1 comma 1, we could start by just letting the slightly easier of these two points, which is x equals 1 on a, we could let that value be equal to 1. So therefore, a must equal 1 for that to happen. And once we know that a equals 1, so we've forced 1 on a, that particular stationary point x value to be at 1, we can sub a equals 1 into the other one, and we get x is equal to b on 4, plus one on four times one is just four. And we could write that with a common denominator being B plus one divided by four. So this is now the X value of the stationary point that's referred to as being at P comma P. So in other words, we can say that therefore P is equal to B plus one divided by four. So we now know there's a relationship between P and B. And we also know that f of p is equal to p. And that's because the stationary point occurs at the point p, p. So on our calculator, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drag down f of x. And because we've identified that a equals one, I'm going to do math three, given that the variable a equals one. I'm gonna hit execute. So this is the rule of f when a is one. I'm actually gonna drag that down and define it. So I'm gonna highlight that and go interactive define. I'm gonna define it still with F, but I'm gonna call this F1. So F1 of X now has this rule, and that's again the function when A is one. And now we identify two equations that still relate to this problem, along with the fact that A is equal to one. So I can use the simultaneous equation solver in math one to help find the value of P, which is ultimately what the question's asking for. So the first equation that we were thinking about was that f when x is p is going to equal p. And that's because the point p comma p is at that stationary point. And the second thing we know is that p is in fact equal to, then I just need to bring up a fraction, and then it was b plus one over four. So if I solve this for both b and P, this should do the problem and finish it off for us. So we get two sets of solutions, B is three and P is one, and B is 15 and P is four. So the calculator gave us two possible pairs of B and P. So one of them was B equals three and P equals one, or the second value was that B is equal to 15 and P equals four. Now from the problem, we know that P does not equal one. So as P does not equal one, we know that P must equal four. So that is the answer to part F of this question. And looking at the examiner's report, we can see that this question was not answered well with only 3% of students getting full marks for this question. And again, over 80% of students not getting any marks for this problem. So as shown on the previous slide, we needed to be able to work with those extra parameters 
And as there was three unknowns, so at one stage we had to find A, B, and then P, we needed to come up with three things that we knew about it. And that's what we demonstrated on that previous slide.